Welcome to um, this session on macroeconomic policy responses to the COVID-19 crisis. And um, uh, by macroeconomic policies, I refer to the full range of fiscal, monetary and trade policies. My name is Dirk Willem Tevelde, and I'm a director for international economic development at ODI. And I'm also a professor of practice uh, at the SOAS University of London. Um, at ODI, I've been leading a project um, on macroeconomic policy responses to COVID-19. Um, and uh, this work has been uh, funded by a grant from the IDRC. And we're working with Southern Voice and five Southern think tanks in Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Peru, Tanzania and, uh, and Kenya. Um, I will pass on to my co-chair, Estefania, in a minute. Um, but let me just point to sort of three salient features of this uh, particular crisis. First of all, whilst we knew that this crisis was going to have a major impact on poorer countries, I hadn't realized how big an impact it was going to have, um, but also that it was going to have a bigger impact on poorer countries, at least taking over two to three years. Um, and that's where we are now. So we definitely um, are seeing a larger impact um, on average, on average. So there's a huge heterogeneity. Also, there will be irreversibilities and also certain vulnerable groups are completely left out of the policy responses. Uh, and that um, is different, I think, uh, from the global financial crisis um, as well. Of course, there are positive um, elements uh, at the moment as well, like the faster uh, uh, sort of response in the digital economy, for example. The second salient feature is that macroeconomic policies have been fairly broad ranging. Uh, that's the good news. But clearly, there's a huge divergence in terms of fiscal space, um, where uh, poorer countries uh, have had much less fiscal space and, um, compared to uh, developed countries in terms of being able to muster a financial um, or a fiscal uh, response. So there's been, there's been constraint. Um, and thirdly, I think uh, there's a lot of untapped potential. So yes, the macroeconomic policy responses have been wide ranging, particularly in the monetary uh, front. Um, there's much more that can be done. Uh, and that's across a range of countries in terms of targeting the fiscal policies, thinking about um, the monetary policies and targeting them, and also better linking trade and production uh, policies. Um, and so we think there's lots of un untapped potential to um, to target what we call a rainbow recovery, um, a recovery that is uh, more transformative, um, it's more inclusive, including of women, um, and it's greener. Um, and we are actually sort of providing the evidence, the, the simulations, the, the assessments that can sort of help to inform uh, policy responses going forward. So on this journey, um, um, uh, we will be um, um, sort of hearing from a range of think tanks, but let me just now pass on um, to uh, my co-chair, Estefania Scherfe from uh, Southern Voice. Over to you, Estefania. Thank you. Welcome, Good morning to this parallel session. Um, today, I'll have the pleasure to co-chair this session together with Derek. My name is Estefania Scherfe, and I'm at the program of Southern Voice. We are a network of think tanks around the global south, and as Derek was mentioning, um, Estefania, would you kindly take the microphone closer to your mouth? It's sure. breaking up. Think tanks um, from the global south. Um, head of program at Southern Voice, and as Derek was mentioning, some of our member organizations have been taking part um, in this research initiative. Um, together with the I hope you can hear me. Let me know if okay, I can do something about it. Um, so, in order to present the key lessons from this joint research project that will be on the effect of COVID 19 across the global south, I would like to first invite Sherilyn to briefly present these key findings. Sherilyn is a senior research uh, officer of the National Economic Development Group. Um, so, after presenting some of the key lessons to leading researchers, I will discuss in more detail the funding from Bangladesh and Indonesia, respectively. Um, I want to remind that this is just a first five minute session, so I would like to allow for full five minute interventions. And I would really like to hear from the public audience. So, if you comment 
can understand our work on and we can use the, the chat and there's the QA on your right. Um, and also, you can check on the camera during the QA edition. I'm going to make the, the, the E with a with microphone. I think uh, I'm still breaking a bit. In more. What are the emerging findings regarding the long-lasting effects of COVID-19 in the global health? Good morning, everyone. I'm Sheridan Riaga, a senior research officer at ODI. We started monitoring the impact and policy responses to COVID-19 since uh, February 2020. And since then, what we observe is the great divide between high and low income countries, depending on their access to vaccine and fiscal resources. For example, G20 economies were able to deploy 22% of GDP's worth of fiscal stimulus packages, but in low-income countries, they were only able to afford 3% of GDP's worth of fiscal support. The latest analysis from the IMF all on this long-term uh, divide is actually very alarming. Advanced economies are expected to have short-lived but deep recession and without any uh, permanent losses. But in developing countries, they are expected to have uh, protracted economic downturns combined with scarring effects. Since the pandemic is expected to shrink some of the contact-intensive uh, sectors permanently and have adverse effects on schooling which are not prepared to uh, shift to virtual learning immediately. Under the IDRC project, we saw that even among the five southern countries, the socioeconomic impact of uh, COVID-19 varied widely. Peru was expected to grow by 3.6% in 2020 based on pre-COVID forecast, but it actually contracted by 11% in 2020, revealing that the uh, Peruvian economy actually lost a total of 15 percentage points of growth to the pandemic. Meanwhile, Tanzania was able to grow by 4.7% in 2020, and this is just one percentage point below a uh, pre-COVID fo forecast. So the Southern uh, Country Case Studies uh, revealed to us rich information on the channels of this uh, pandemic impact, but today I wanted to highlight four key factors that explain the growth differences among the Southern countries. So the first one is the timing and stringency of the mobility restrictions imposed. So Peru was one of the first countries worldwide to impose a very strict national lockdown, almost halting its activities in mining, construction, and services sector. Meanwhile, Tanzania did not impose any national lockdown, enabling its actors to continue their economic activities business as usual. The second factor is the structure of these economies, which revealed to us the heterogeneity on the main channels of COVID impact in these countries, be it on export uh, in the Bangladesh and Sri Lankan cases, or through services and tourism in Kenya and Tanzania, or large unemployment effects in Peru. Common among these countries is that there is a disproportionate impact on women, youth, and uh, those employed in the informal sector in terms of unemployment and reduced wages. There are also some nuances in around these structural issues. So one is the offsetting impact that we observe from Kenya's um, uh, record high demand for tea during the pandemic. And Tanzania also benefited from rising global gold prices during the crisis. Second is the counter-cyclical role of remittances in southern countries, defying uh, earlier downside forecast. Unfortunately, we are also seeing an emergence of the new poor and an observed reversal of structural transformation. Uh, this is very evident in Bangladesh and will have um, uh, uh, permanent losses in terms of human capital, income, and productivity. And all this will have negative implications in long-term growth. The third factor is, of course, the magnitude of policy responses during the pandemic. Uh, the, the, uh, in all southern countries, it is evident that central banks have been swift and generally were successful in increasing the lending in their economies. But on the government side, fiscal responses have been heavily shaped by the initial fiscal conditions among these countries. 
So for example, Kenya entered this pandemic with a pre-existing debt sustainability issues which constrained the government to deploy just 2.4% of GDP's worth of fiscal stimulus, and this is lower than what was deployed in sub-Saharan African countries or low-income countries on average. The final point that I want to highlight is that the implementation and the quality and type of policy instruments matter. Uh, country case studies are in consensus that there are challenges in terms of inefficiencies and implementation of fiscal stimulus, and there are also limited distributional impact in terms of um, on the side of monetary policy measures implemented during the crisis. But generally, we assess that these economic responses have been helpful, but they are not targeted enough to put or incorporate rainbow stimulus elements which are needed to, for countries to build back better from the pandemic. Currently, the packages have been heavily tilted on red stimulus or those uh, short-term interventions intended to stimulate uh, demand, for example, temporary capital loans or uh, cash transfers. There are also very muted response in terms of green recovery efforts and blue stimulus, which are, in, which are supposed to um, support markets and uh, trade diversification. We also observe very little evidence in terms of targeting um, improvement in quality of economic participation of women and youth, or what we call yellow stimulus. We also wanted to flag the Sri Lankan case, which adopted a restrictive trade regime policy during the pandemic. While this has helped Sri Lanka's trade deficit to narrow down, uh, at least for now, this may have negative repercussions that is long-term and might be irreversible. And this will have implications on Sri Lanka's trade competitiveness and diversification. And this is actually an opposite of what a blue stimulus should look like. Moving forward, we encourage southern countries to look into a more balanced rainbow stimulus combining red and yellow ones to ensure that no one gets left behind, uh, green spending to ensure that future growth are disaster proof, and of course blue stimulus to support upscaling, diversification, and um, transformation of sectors that will increase the quality of growth in the future. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Sherry Ling, for sharing these insights. Um, I would like to now move on to, to and invite uh, Deb and Tausi to join some of their particular findings. So I would like to start with, with you, Tausi. Can you please tell us a little more of how have uh, the macronomic um, impacts uh, in Tanzania, how have uh, they been in, in Tanzania, how these impacts have affected the country and ha um, how um, have the country have been responding to, to them? Um, please, Tausi, Lina, can we pl please play Tausi's video? Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Tausi Pagakida. I'm the Executive Director of Economic and Social Research Foundation based in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. ESRF has been grateful for this opportunity to be a member of this very important study on shaping the macroeconomic in response to COVID-19 and I'll be providing the experience from Tanzania. Uh, Tanzania has experienced its first case of COVID-19 in March 2020, and so far we have been having uh, about three waves of uh, this pandemic. The pandemic has had a very severe impact on our social and economic performance. And as we can see that our GDP growth went down to 4.7% last year, whereas Tanzania, we have been experienced an average growth of about 8% 8, 8 and above for the last uh, 10 years or so. Several sectors uh, have been affected due to, to this uh, pandemic, and this includes the agriculture sector, and especially the performance on horticulture subsector. Uh, tourism sector has been severely affected, transport and logistics, industry and trade, but also the social, uh, the burden of the provision of social sectors also have been uh, severely also affected. This includes the, the health sector, as you know, already the health sector is stretched 
now with the pandemic was a bit uh, even more stretched. Uh, education sector, as last year, we had to close schools for about three months so that to, pro to protect our kids from, from this pandemic. Although the country has not unveiled um, any uh, stimulus packages, but several measures have been undertaken to counter the effect of this pandemic. These include short-term measures, but also medium and long-term physical policy options. I'll start with the short-term measures that have been undertaken so far, and I will dwell, I'll dwell on uh, three of them. Uh, the first one including, uh, we had to reprioritize the 2021 budget expenditure uh, through allocating more funding to the health system to enable the sector to cope with the pandemic. Secondly, to mobilize funding from development partners, non-state actors soliciting concessional loans from the World Bank and FDB, as well as obtaining COVID-related debt relief from IMF. And lastly, budgeting substantial funding for implementation of social protection and social safety nets measures to avert an estimated 500,000 Tanzanians from falling back into poverty. Uh, medium and long-term physical policy options include uh, we developed and adopted the third five-year development plan 2021-2022 to 2025-2026 with the COVID mitigation measures uh, in mind. And this plan provides strategies and plans backed by adequate financing to help the economy bounce back and build better. Uh, secondly, supporting private sector-led industrialization to manufacture, process, and add value to the country's large natural resources and products that are currently exported without adding much value. Um, third, financing and implementing many physical infrastructure investment and in the construction of new tarmac roads, improvement of our airports. Um, uh, we are heavily investing in our SGR uh, railway line and so forth. And then, uh, Another one is on uh, advocating and mainstreaming uh, gender uh, in all country strategies and plans in order to create an inclusive and equitable society where men and women have equal rights in all matters, including addressing traditional stereotypes in order to bounce back better and leave no one behind in the pandemic recovery strategy. And lastly, our want to mention directing government agencies, business actors to harness the potential of digitalization and e-commerce for the country to be a better place to benefit the global market for its goods and services in digitalizing world trade era amidst the clear deadly pandemic and global interruption of international trade. As I can say that uh, the future now is hopeful, uh, as the access of vaccination is improving both at the global level, even here in Tanzania, we have just, we have received uh, the first batch of our vaccination um, and uh, now uh, vaccination is accessible to all Tanzania age 18 and above. So I can say this is really very post positive and the future now looks brighter. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, Tausi. Um, maybe before doing some follow-up questions, I would like to move on to our next speaker and then we can go back to, to do some, um, get your, your follow-up insights. So now I would like to invite Deb Apriyev at the chariot. Um, so Deb is a distinguished fellow at uh, CPD, a well-known, um, well-established think tank in Bangladesh. And among others, he's also chair of, uh, of Southern Voice. Um, so, Deb, please, can you tell us a little bit more about the differences or the changes that you have seen um, in the macroeconomic sector regarding, let's say, business as usual? And also, what are the long-lasting um, impacts of, of the pandemic um, that you see in Bangladesh? Thank you Deb, very much. Um, hello, colleagues. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever is suitable. Um, pleased to be here. Uh, let me concentrate on a couple of points, which uh, may be a bit distinct from what my predecessors have been talking about. First of all, you need to understand the country itself. 
it's important. The contextual realities are very important. The benchmark conditions are important. So Bangladesh uh, is got um, the first infection was detected back in March 2019. Bangladesh uh, ranks 26th in the world in terms of infection and eighth in Asia. So it's a moderately affected country by the pandemic. Is going through its uh, second wave is receding, third wave is anticipated. So the macroeconomic impact on the growth is that uh, it didn't, the economy did not contract, uh, but it came down to its lowest um, growth uh, rate, 3.2%, uh, uh, which is the lowest in the last decade. Uh, and 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 there had been impact on various areas, as may be as may be expected. But there is a K-shaped recovery going on at this moment, both in exports, remittances, uh, revenue collection, public expenditure, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the response on the part of the government had been a set of measures, uh, which essentially included direct food transfer and direct fiscal support. Uh, more liquidity into the system through monetary uh, easing, uh, then more uh, private sector um, support through various kinds of hybrid in, uh, interest rate decrease and uh, support to the workers, uh, payments through loan, special credit lines. And there had been also various kinds of twe budgetary tweaking with the tariff rates and the tax rates uh, so that the domestic market-oriented industry can pick up a bit so, but the, essentially, it was more focused, and so the as a share of GDP, it was it ranged from two point two percent to one point seven percent in two years. Um, uh, but these are all allocation. The, the real disbursement had been much less. So, and 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 there had been targeted policy here and there, but essentially, it was monetary policy dominated package, and at the same time, a bit of a hybrid where you have uh, fiscal uh, under subsidization of the. Uh, interest rate in certain ways. So the point which I'm going to make here today is this is my only point I am have in this morning is that the the, bon the stimulus packages had been pretty skewed in favor of the monetary policies, whereas the the impact of direct fiscal transfer and food support would have had much better impact, particularly from the point of view of the disproportionately affected left behind people. So the macro intervention with a much more inclusive and balanced micro results. That is my whole point today. For that matter, uh, we, what we have done is we have run a set of simulation and two major uh, scenarios have been conceived. One, if we would have increased the public expenditure uh, two times, doubling the public expenditure, what effect would have got in the recovery process. The other is given the importance of human uh, development inputs, if you have uh, increased by 50% the public expenditure on health and education, <coughs> sorry, what would have been the impact? So these are the two scenarios if we want to improve upon the, the monetary policy impact on the left behind people who are disproportionately affected due to the pandemic. So let me share with you the results. The results are quite interesting in the sense that in both cases, we find the impact on the left behind categories. And we have five groups of you know, five segments of uh, population, starting from marginal farmers to landless farmers, people with education, people, uh, workers without education. So we see that in both cases, what, what is happening is, is in, 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 in these cases that the impact on the relatively marginalized communities, whether in the rural or in the urban area, there had been much more effective or improvement in terms of their intake, uh, whether it's wage or in income is much more higher in these cases. What is uh, important to note is that in both cases, we see it is not the it is not the GDP growth rate which really records higher level or even the, although exports also increases, but it is the income and the consumption of the marginalized people which incomes increases much more. In in both cases, what we all observe that those who are educated they seem to gain a bit more, and skill labor seems to gain. Uh, gain a bit more. This has serious uh, important policy in, uh, conclusion uh, implication in terms of 
designing other collateral measures in order for these people to get, so that they can benefit maximize their benefit in these cases the, the as you know in all these cases the consideration had been do we have the fiscal space do we have the money to run this kind of relatively expansionary fiscal policies in these in poor poorer economies whether the revenue collection is around 10 to 12% at the 15% of the gdp so our study shows that while fiscal concern fiscal space concern is an important thing but it is not necessarily the most important thing it is the ability to spend even if you have the money is a much more challenging case over here given the nature of the institutions the policies and the ability to directly touch the households level information and and uh, access them and engage them through a whole of the society approach that is no less an important part so the in the existing wisdom globally is that it is the fiscal space we should be concerned about i am contending here fiscal space may be important but no less important is the institutional capacity or the capability or it is information base to reach out those left behind and create a synergistic approach in terms of rebounding a, with a much more broader base not a k shaped recovery but in 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 fact a reverse pyramid type of recovery or or type of with with a pyramid type of recovery which we can think of and this will also have implication in terms of blending other policies along with it whether it is green financing whether it is gender sensitive policies whether it is trying to reach out to the child um, you know labor which may have increased in during the pandemic and also in terms of the other health related issues which we are see as spending because the public health service and the education service it has to be improved upon that is one of the you know most major message which is coming through so colleagues that was essentially my point that the the recovery package in the future uh, this has to be blended along with the transformative changes which we are talking about and within that the fiscal policy particularly public expenditure its quality and its impact will play the key role thank you thank you very much uh deb uh, without going any further i want to invite um any members of the audience who would like to ask any questions or or make a comment please uh make a request to share your video and camera we would be uh, more than happy to hear um, also from you. Um, in the meantime, um, while you while you get your questions ready, um, I just want to make a follow-up question um, to you, Deb, and Tausi, if uh, let us know if your microphone is working well. But to you, Deb, um, I wanted to ask um, how reversible do you think are these changes that you have seen um, so far, mostly regarding vulnerable populations and those who are normally uh, left behind? Uh, thank you. Thank you for the question, uh, Stephanie. The, no, we, 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 we are now looking into uh, these changes, what we have seen in the economy and the society and in the governance. Uh, uh, the, the first is that their manifestation. Two is their duration. And of course, their irreversibility or how do you take it forward? Or how do you really get a synergistic trade-offs in these cases over there? So say, let, give him, let me give you a concrete example. The schools, particularly the secondary school and primary schools, have been closed for the last 14 months. Now they are going to open as the vaccination has come to a certain critical level coverage. And we are going to open up the schools. Now what we see in, during this period, what has happened? Number one, a big digital divide has emerged because many people do not have smartphone, young people, they cannot afford gigabytes in order to access online uh, accessing uh, assignments and teaching. So there is a digital divide to be dealt with. Number two, we have seen there had been dropouts, early marriages of young girls getting married due to number of circumstances, not only because the school is closed, but also because of the income poverty has increased in the family, marginalized family. So we have a lot of girls drop out from the school and third during this period we have seen because of lack of income in the, in the family many young people uh, children uh, or young boys have gone out and become child labor so the the important part of the recovery package is that in order to make this 
to bring back to the new normal, we will have to have much more targeted policies supported by those fiscal policy I've just mentioned in order to have much more, you know, that kind of to catch up with the earlier stage and to bring back to the normal. These are possible. And all these things have in, have reflected upon an increasing social discrimination of the existing of the existing structural flaws and have also created a new layer of structural discrimination over there. So we have a double whammy over here to deal with. And it is every policies in the country, in the, each of the sector, I have just given the education sector. This could have been in the health. It could have been also in other areas of decent jobs and everything. We'd have to think through these kind of uh, policies. And I see the think tanks have a big role to play in the South and not only in the south, but also in the north. And maybe collaborative approach is much more useful in these cases for blending of experiences to give the perfect solution for each of the countries. As we do not be believe one size fits all, that is important part of it. You may have a general idea, but each of the countries have to work it through. I think that's a task we have in hand. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deb. Um, there is one question, um, one question, one more question for you. Uh, but the, before that, I want to double check with Tausi if uh, you can't unmute yourself right now. So um, is, is your microphone working right now or not really? We, yeah, I think we still have a problem over there. So uh, I think I'm going to um, just move on to, to the next question that is for you. That So Jose Valdivia asks, um, can you explain more about the transformative actions that must be included in recovery packages? The the one of the transformative uh, there 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 may be many, many one from the supply side another from the demand side. On the supply side, we think the quality of the institutions, its information base is very critical. There are countries which wanted to reach out to the poor people, to the disadvantaged, to the left behind, to the push behind people, but they didn't have an adequate database to deal with it. So having the uh, quality of institution, the database and the local government performances will be critical. But let me come to the supply uh, demand side part. The demand side part is very what is important. What we see the returns to skilled labor returns to education is going to increase tremendously in the coming days, particularly with the digital divide out there. So it is very important. On, in our build back, strat build back better strategy. And the better would be not only about greening, not only about gender sensitivity, but also about skill intensity, about the upgraded skills which will be necessary in the coming days so that they can respond to the new market demands. I won't go as far as the fourth industrial revolution um, uh, looming large. I will just say how the global supply value chain is going to increase and the skill intensity is going to take place. So uh, even in sectors like the garments apparel sector, one of the major sectors in most of the uh, exporting developing countries, the, the demand on uh, artificial intelligence, on the robotization and upgraded skills will be very important. And, and this is where you blend your skill uh, transformation policy with the greening policy and the gender policy together. So that when this skill transformation takes place, the demand on skills uh, in, uh, takes place and women are linked to that and do have a sustainable green policy along attached to that. That is that uh, the, the, the triangulation, I would think will make the difference in the transformation. The skills, the gender, and the, uh, and the green. These are the three, tri uh, the triangulation, I would say, is a sure short thing in the future. Will we get money for that? Will the private investment get returns for that? That is for, the, for us to see whether there are no market distortions so that these investments really get uh, credited for that. And I also see international support measures coming from the development partners, international development partners, putting in their good resources, scarce resources in this area. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Deb. Um, in, the, in the meantime, I have a type of question for you, Tausi. It would be would be super interesting to learn a little bit more about why the economic impacts that seem to be very would have been the case. We would like to understand a little bit better. So, in case you cannot unmute yourself, you can always type your answer, and then we're happy to share here. Um, I don't. 
there any other questions um, in the Q Q and A? I would like to really encourage you to to also make uh, any any comments. Um, in the meantime, um, I want to invite also Dirk to a key reflection based on, on these uh, uh, first uh, two presentations. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Estefania. Um, I mean, I, th I think the presentations are, are, are very interesting and also so wide ranging experiences that we've encountered in the sort of the five countries that we've now heard from Bangladesh and also Tanzania initially. Um, and also the sort of the, the policy responses are uh, have differed uh, quite a fair bit. Um, <clears throat> sort of in Tanzania, from my understanding, is that um, quite in, sort of in the beginning, in the first year, uh, it was all business of, as usual. And it's only now, actually, that now with a sort of new government, um, that um, there is a bit more of a change um, and uh, there's more, more active engagement. Um, it's there is now. Uh, generally, a sort of approach towards more openness, as I, I see it, um, uh, of, of the economy. Um, and uh, but, but the main response response was business as usual, um, the five-year development plan, um, and um, and and that that was the case. In Bangladesh, there there has been a response, um, and there has been a fiscal uh, response um, uh, as well. Um, but I think what we hear from 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 Depp, and perhaps that's also a question, perhaps to him, is that um, the, there has been a response, and the magnitude of the response matters. And I think that's just something that Sherilyn has highlighted um, as one of the four factors of why uh, the impact of COVID has been different uh, across countries. Um, so it's the structure of the economy, the, the health responses, the size of uh, the, the the responses, whether it's fiscal or monetary, and most of the uh, countries have actually, they were fiscally restrained, were focusing much more on monetary policies, and they've been quite flexible across the range of countries. Um, they've been able to step in, um, and we we still don't know the full sort of in inclusivity impacts of those sort of uh, uh, non-traditionally monetary policies. But the fiscal resp responses have been sort of important. But what Deb is putting on the table as well is that it's implementation cap capacity and it's the targeting that also matters, and I think that's something that Sharon has highlighted, and that's where we have played, uh, we are playing a, uh, a huge, important role as think tanks, as the as the as the community around policymakers, is to basically say it's not just uh, whether or not you have responded, it's also how you respond matters for the type of recovery, for the transformation effects, um, and so we need to make sure that we continue to monitor um, the uh, the impacts, but also the policy responses, and we want to understand whether governments are learning. Uh, are they changing uh, their policy responses as as we go along? Are they actually uh, becoming more targeted? We now know a bit more about the crisis. Initially, it was it was a complete crisis response. Now we know a bit more. So, um, unfortunately, we can't hear from Tausi, but I'm just interested to see to hear more about what what is going on in countries. Are they actually saying, "Well, now crisis is done and we're back to"? Or are we actually taking seriously the irreversibilities, the impacts that we've seen, and we're going to target our policy responses? And we we learn, and now we're ready to to think about more about transformation impacts. Do you see any space there, Deb? Um, yeah. um, and, and I'm really interested about this sort of short term versus uh, sort of longer longer term impacts, and and perhaps now. Um, whilst we know that the poorer countries have had a larger impact on average, they can close some back by by thinking about sort of appropriate policies to their circumstances. Is there space to 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 uh, think about more inclusive and a greener recovery in in Bangladesh, for example? Shall I come in? Yes, please. Go. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Dirk. I, I think that's a good reflection. And uh, let me make up for my uh, you know, missed point. Uh, Sherlyn did a fantastic summary of all the points over there. We, we, in, and obviously, the four or five points, uh, how do you explain the diversity of responses and their size, magnitude, and the nature the, and their effectiveness in terms of delivery. That's a, that was very well taken. And Dirk, you have taken it one step forward. Let me say first thing first, in that way, once we have um, publicized a bit of our, uh, survey, uh, our study results, 
uh, we did see some response on the part of the government. The uh, uh, in the post budget that is met in July, last July, the government has come up in Bangladesh with another set of uh, stimulus packages, as they call it. Uh, although it's a misnomer in certain way, it's a public assistance policy uh, packages, and because incentives are only for those who are. Oh, no, where, where you have the some kind of hybrid commercial loan mechanism, not necessarily on the transfers. So, and very incident, uh, very curiously, the whole package has been dominated by the fiscal intervention. So I, I think that the government, when they were responding to the second wave of the uh, pandemic, they did realize that they need to not only improve upon the size, the magnitude of the fiscal and food, ta food transfer to, to, to protect the consumption level of the uh, left behind people and, and, in, and by implication, uh, you, you know, withhold the deepening of inequality. But they also understood that they will have to complement it, uh, the, 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 excess li the, the liquidity channeled into the private sector for reinvestment or opening up the sectors or, or saving them from bankruptcy has to be complemented by the labor market interventions through consumption protection and other things. I, and that's, as a result, you will see that, uh, we see that there, there had been much more greater emphasis on fiscal transfers and et cetera. You're on, you're on mute now. You're muted. Sorry, I, I have been left behind. So somebody has intervened. So uh, the, the issue is that uh, the, uh, the information uh, deficit is a critical area. I think it's for most of the countries. Although in most countries, the digitization has progressed very fast during the last one year. Uh, use of various kinds of apps in the public services and also you know, both in education and other areas. But nonetheless, the data deficit is severe. So this is all of a sudden, even when case of vaccination, we are uh, seeing those kind of things and also how to really do that. So how do you really improve upon the data gap without intervening into the private policy of uh, private privacy or um, undermining the pri privacy of individuals, citizens, in a less than democratic country is uh, again a bigger moral challenge which we have in in front of us at this moment as well. So uh, my general point to, um, uh, to Dirk William that yes, it, it, we, we we see that uh, there are changes in the packages, but and also there are also attempts to link the pandemic related measures to the other policy frameworks which are there in the country. For example, in Bangladesh, we are preparing for the LDC graduation. So the LDC graduation trajectory is now being linked to those kind of things that because of the LDC graduation, we are going to lose some preferential market access measures in those in that in response to that what kind of diversification we want to do within our uh, uh, export sector. but also within the productive capacity building as a whole. So it is being linked with one with the other along with that on, the, on those. We are also linking it to the SDG policies because SDG policies talks about leave no one behind. And we are seeing how they are going to be impacting upon the SDGs. And for example, one issue is coming out very strongly. That is the intergenerational equity issue because of the pandemic. And one particular area which has come out in our research is the nutrition area. Because the one of the adjustment process or coping process of the poor households had been cut back on the meals, cut back on your protein intake, cut back on your food, uh, you know, child food, uh, ch uh, ch uh, children's food in that way. So if that be the case, how the intergenerational equity will show up, which may not immediately come in our radar given our assessment framework. So as I say that we see the recovery issues now being linked to the LDC graduation issues along with your five-year plans and others and also your SDG trajectory as it goes. This is how the informed policy making is happening and we have a big role to play to alert the policymakers to these pitfalls. Thank you. Uh, you're breaking, Stefania. You're breaking up, Estefania.
and now we can't hear you. Maybe we could um, directly go to Tausi. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, Stefania, we can't hear you, and Tausi, we can't hear you either. I suppose maybe we also need to. We're, we're finishing um, uh, towards the end of the session. If you type in, Stefania, could you have just one final reflection, maybe Sherlyn, uh, from you, on the importance of uh, the type uh, and quality of fiscal stimulus? Maybe you can say a little bit more on that. Um, so how important that is, and I think that's something where the focus of of our uh, sort of policy uh, outreach should, should be uh, should be on. Yes. Uh, so I wanted to highlight no, uh, the, of course, the magnitude. You're of still muted. Hello. Is it all it's right? Fine. Okay. Carry on. Oh, yeah. uh, the, fiscal, the type of fiscal stimulus instrument matters, of course. And we have first. I want to highlight the short term and long term objectives. So uh, Deb and Tausi and uh, every uh, uh, southern countries under the IDRC projects have been very proactive in terms of small cash transfer payments. Um, but these are short term in nature. Of course, we can never go wrong with this because the vulnerable are directly affected. But we have to move and look forward. How do we sustain this? How would the government um, sustain the uh, continuous uh, social uh, protection programs? Um, so we need to incorporate as early as now some long term objectives. And that is how you is stimulate the private said private led side of the recovery so that's how you should put like um blue stimulus that should that should support trade diversification it's very interesting what has happened to kenya that has experienced a very minimal um, um impact on growth because of the compensating impact of tourism on one side and then they have a diverse set of um export that actually grew in the pandemic so it highlights to us the importance of diversification and if you are investing now for example in um, um, red stimulus, but is target targeted. There are already multiple uh, existing empirical evidence that you can achieve multiple objectives at the same time. For instance, if you spend like uh, environmentally environmentally friendly on safe um, water and sanitation, it's targeted to women. It can improve their welfare. It also stimulates the um, infrastructure development in the local area that can stimulate investment. So it has it can achieve multiple investment at the same time. So we have to um, to to start uh, looking at the diversification of mobilization of resources. Maybe just find a final thought on the green stimulus. All southern countries have been very low on this uh, area, but I think uh, this is where the international donor community could could check could could uh, be more proactive because the technicalities, of course, and the demonstration effects we have. Um, um, fiscal gover governments in the southern country are already constrained with the red stimulus supporting their most vulnerable one and so there are limited resources for other investments so this is where the collaboration should step in at, uh, at this uh, juncture so we can prevent the great divide that Deb is talking about and the IMF is talking about there has to be complementarities and maximization of synergies around these instruments thank you all right. Um, I don't know whether, uh, Stefania, you can... Um, uh, 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 William, can I get half a minute, may I, before uh, Stefania speaks? I, I think we also need to finalize, but why don't you have half a minute? I, if, uh, no, no, no. My general point is about green financing. The, every, the incidence is low is because there are market distortions still and the markets do not really re uh, reward the, uh, the investment. That is what we have seen till now. In the, So we'll have to do some market reforms there. My other point on the, on the long-term of objective and on this there is a growing consensus that we need to invest more in public health services and in as a share of gdp this is abysmally low it is two to three percent in most cases but my, but i think the biggest achievement now in the developing countries is that there is a overwhelming consensus on the need to have a universal social protection scheme a universal pension scheme at the least and that is the new consensus which we have generated thanks to all the bad things which has happened to us over the last one and a half year. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, indeed, Deb, um, and um, uh, and also Sherlyn and also uh, and uh, Tausi for the for the video um, and Estefania for uh, for moderating. 
uh, maybe I should uh, I should now close the, the meeting and uh, just thank you for uh, for these reflections. Um, this study is um, uh, is some, is uh, is in progress and will will uh, will will publish the studies and emerging findings soon. Um, and I think uh, one thing that is uh, that is really important, I think, is to sort of uh, now move away from only thinking about what were the short term responses to really in try and integrate the policy responses with sort of the longer term. Uh, goals and where are we going to, um, and thinking about a, a sort of a, a really a, a better uh, recovery and, um, and 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 sort of thinking about how we sort of reach out to policymakers um, in in future around uh, the different types of, of stimulus uh, uh, packages, the different types of monetary policies and also trade policies um, that we have simulated. And so, um, looking forward to um, uh, to do more of that. Thank you very much, Deb, for. Uh, for the explanations on the Bangladesh uh, economy and uh, Stefania for moderating the panel and and uh, Sherlyn and Tausi also for your contributions. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.